Hi everyone and welcome back to the next webinar in our Plante Presents Global Plant Science Talk Series. My name is Katie Rogers and I'm your host for today's webinar. This webinar series is brought to you today by Plante, the open online community for plant scientists powered by the American Society of Plant Biologists. I would like to give you a special thank you to all of our ASPB members who are attending today. Your ASPB membership dues help support and make these webinars possible. For any of you who have not yet joined ASPB, you can join today and use the discount code PRESENTS10 to receive a 10% discount on registration. ASPB members get early access to these seminars. You can learn more about ASPB and the opportunities we provide at ASPB.org. So far, we've held 28 events in these, this series. We've had so many amazing talks this year. If you haven't already done so, do check out our archive to watch all of the previous talks in the series. You can find information about each event on our plantae.org blog and subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notifications when new recordings are posted. We have more events lined up through April. Visit plantae.org slash education slash plantae presents to register for them all. On March 3rd, Usha and Ramesh will be joining us at a special time to share their research. If you need to leave this webinar early, know that a recording of this webinar will be made available within a few days. Today's talks will each be 20 minutes each. As you listen to each talk, add your questions for our panelists in the Zoom question and answer Q&A section. Questions specifically for our panelists should be shared within the Q&A section to make them easier for our moderator to navigate. You'll also notice that there is a chat area open. This section is for you to introduce yourselves, say where you're from and connect with your colleagues. Today's talk is moderated by Dorota Kaba. Dorota's main research interest is how roots function in a dynamic environment. She is currently a postdoc in the lab of Siobhan Brady at UC Davis and explores mechanisms by which microbes induce resistance to the parasitic weed striga in sorghum roots. Dorota is an assistant features editor at the plant cell. You can also find her on Twitter at Dorota underscore Kawa. All right, with that, I'll go ahead and hand, hand it over to Dorota to introduce our next speaker and moderate today's session. Thanks, Dorota. Thank you, Katie. Welcome, everyone. It is a great pleasure to moderate today's Plantaia seminar with two very exciting talks coming. Our first speaker is Professor Malcolm Bennett. Malcolm received his PhD from the University of Warwick, where he also started later his own research group. He was appointed chair of plant scientists at plant sciences at the University of Nottingham in 1998, where he also established the Center for Plant Integrative Biology. He leads in the multidisciplinary research team and uses state-of-the-art computed tomography facility to image root architecture in soil in a non-invasive way. His research focuses on root development and adaptations to soil environment. Recent work of his team and collaborators characterized mechanisms by which roots grow and branch towards water and how roots sense and penetrate hard soils. Malcolm received several awards, including a Royal Society Wolfson Research Fellowship. He is an EMBO member and a fellow of the Royal Society. Malcolm, thank you for joining us today and I look forward to your talk. Oh, thank you very much, Teresa. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, uh, to be asked to give a plant a seminar um, and um, I look forward to talking about the, the work you, you mentioned, um, uh, uh, the recent work on soil compaction. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. That's great. And I'll minimize, I'll minimize that. That's great. Okay, um, so thank you very much uh, everyone for uh, your uh, interest in, in this topic and thank you for the invitation uh, to present this work. Um, it's very much a, a team effort from a multinational team and I'll introduce the members as we go along. Um, it really investigates a topic which is incredibly important agronomically, which is soil compaction and how we can develop crops to overcome this issue. Um, and this work really, my interest in soils have really uh, stems from uh, um, setting up the Hounsfield facility. Uh, the Hounsfield facility um, is a, a CT imaging facility that was uh, founded in 2014, and it brought together 
soil scientists, plant scientists, crop scientists, computer scientists, engineers and mathematicians to uh, really understand, to work at the interface of these disciplines and to understand how root and soil and the microbiome interact with one another to uh, generate um, adaptive responses. And uh, the uh, facility, this is a, a Lego model that we use when we go to do science outreach activities, uh, shows you if you take the lid off the, uh, the roof off the facility, we've got several different CT machines that we use, which are different scales. We have a very high resolution nanotom, uh, which can do soil analysis, so very detailed structures that uh, nanometer resolution, we have a mid CT scan, and then we have a, a large CT scanner that can uh, examine plants uh, and grow them through their entire life cycle. And here we have a, a, a quick video which shows uh, we can grow, uh, in this case, wheat plants uh, throughout their life cycle. And then we use robotics to move them around the greenhouse. Uh, and then we use various ro uh, robotic arms to insert them into a uh, room size CT scanner. And this allows us to be able to scan um, objects as large as one meter uh, in length and uh, 25 centimeters wide. So we can look at crops such as wheat throughout their life cycle. So this image shows you the actual X-ray screen here. Uh, and uh, the CT scan works by uh, rotating the object, firing at the X-ray gun, as you've just seen there, and then doing this approximately 8,000 times. Uh, through one meter long column. And uh, the data sets which we generate, which are, almost, which are in terabytes, they're massive data sets, then allow us to reconstruct uh, the uh, images. And this is just an example of uh, one of those time course image data sets we generated for wheat. So uh, this allows us to understand in, in this case, in this movie, uh, how roots are growing. Initially, we're seeing the uh, seminal roots as they uh, grow uh, during early stages of root development. And then we see this flush of tiller roots. And so the beauty of CT is that we can do, it's a non-invasive approach to understand how roots grow in soil. Now we've used this approach to study a very important question in uh, agronomy, which is uh, to understand how roots grow in field soils. And uh, this is uh, work led by one of my colleagues, Sasha Mooney, um, who's a soil physicist. And what Sasha uh, observed uh, from these field studies is that roots, we imagine roots grow uh, uh, deep into the soil. But what this uh, data I'm showing here illustrates are a variety of different wheat uh, var uh, varieties which uh, really struggle uh, to penetrate deeper soils uh, below the plow pan. So as you can see, uh, we have soil depth on the side, and uh, as you go below 30 centimeters, which is the plow pan, this is as deep as you get uh, for, for plowing, you can see how roots really struggle to penetrate in the remaining uh, uh, depth. And on the, uh, on the left-hand side, you can actually see a, a large CT scan. These are soil columns, take, uh, soil cores taken from the, from the field, and you can see how compacted the soil is the deeper it goes reflecting how heavy the soil is. And you can see in the upper soil, this is a far more aerated, and this is why roots are able to, to colonize it far more easily. In fact, one of the most interesting observations from this paper is that the roots which do penetrate uh, uh, below the plow pan tend to colonize biopores. So these are, these are uh, natural uh, structures formed through uh, micro uh, fauna activities uh, or weathering and you can or previous plants and the roots tend to follow the same paths. So this tells us we have a real problem uh, in deeper soils in terms of how hard they are and how easy it is for the, our crops to access. Now hard soils are not just a problem with um, below the plow pan, they also uh, can uh, form in the top 30 centimeters as well. And soil compaction is an increasing problem here, and it really has an impact on crop yields. It's thought that you can reduce up to one quarter of the yields through soil compaction uh, of the upper soil. And when combined, you can imagine when combined with drought, uh, the inability of roots to penetrate the soil uh, can have catastrophic effects. You can lose up to 75% of the yields. 
Now, in modern agriculture, this is really a product of um, increasing weight of uh, the machinery uh, which are used uh, to uh, farm uh, the soils. And this can cause really dramatic effects in terms of plant production. You can see in the picture here on the, on the lower uh, left, you can see uh, how root crops are really struggling to grow in a heavily compacted uh, strip of land in this field experiment. Now, this is not a small niche issue. It's estimated that almost over half the, the land that's farmed in Europe is prone to compaction. That's uh, close to 38 million hectares of land. So this is a major agronomic problem and one in which um, there are a number of management, but potentially uh, crop breeding solutions. So we became very interested in this through our interactions in the hounds field to understand how what happens to root growth during compaction. And so what we have here are, are a series of images of um, uh, rice roots grown through uh, uh, non-compacted soil. So on the left, you can see uh, we have uh, the yellow illustrates where the, the, the roots are growing. And you can see the CT images reveal the, the nice uh, uh, non-compacted soil with the air spaces. And on the, on the next image, you can see there is the similar uh, one centimeter layer of uncompacted soil where we germinate the rice seeds in. And then we have the heavily compacted lower layers. Um, the numbers I refer to here, refer to bulk density, and that shows you how, how many grams of soil there is per centimeter squared of, uh, uh, um, of volume. And you can see that low soil uh, bulk densities, the roots grow happily. This is wild type rice and a very high bulk density, they struggle to penetrate the soil. And on the, on the right here, we can see uh, the plants when they've been removed uh, and photographed separate from the soil, you can see how the root uh, really struggle to grow. And as the roots struggle to grow, they obviously uh, take up few, uh, they have a smaller uh, surface area, so they take up less water and nutrients. And this is where we see a big impact on yield. Now, we wanted to understand more about the mechanisms which control this growth inhibition uh, response. And so this is where, uh, this is the work that was recently published in Science I'd like to talk about. So uh, one of the key people in this study is Bipin Pandey. He's a, a, a research fellow in our, in, in our team. And Bipin very carefully uh, removed roots from soil, uh, either grown in compacted or non-compacted conditions. Um, as you can see from these cross sections, he's taken these uh, roots, he's, he's sectioned them and then imaged them on the confocal. And it, it, it nicely reveals that close to the meristem, Roots grown under the two conditions are of similar arrangements, but as the roots, uh, as the root cells expand and differentiate, they undergo very different paths. And as you can see, there's a massive increase in root cortical uh, radial expansion in the case of compacted soil. So there is a dramatic change in the thickness of the root, and this is largely driven through cortical cell expansion. Now, when Bipin originally showed me these images, it reminded me very much of uh, roots when they're treated by, uh, with ethylene. And this is an example of a, of a rice root after it's been treated with ethylene. You can see that it mimics very much this behavior. You see this, this bulging of the cells in the elongation zone. And this is really uh, caused by the inhibition of elongation and the increase in radial expansion. And this gives it this uh, characteristic uh, shape behavior. And the obvious experiment to do next was to understand exactly what the role of ethylene might be during compaction. So we took advantage of uh, mutants which have been generated by several Chinese collaborators um, in critical components of the ethylene signaling cascade. For those who aren't familiar with the ethylene signaling cascade, we have ethylene binds the receptor ETR1. It then goes through various kinases and signaling components to then um, stabilize a transcription factor which switches on an ethylene response. So in this case, we, meet, uh, we took advantage of the availability of a rice mutant, which lacked, uh, disrupted the uh, iron 2 signaling component. So this mutant is effectively ethylene insensitive. And you can see that when we grow these plants in normal non-compacted soil, they very happily penetrate just like wild type. We were 
really surprised with the following result. When we grow them in compacted soil, we observed that unlike wild type, the ethylene mutants uh, appeared blind to the compaction conditions and carried on to grow as normal, as if it wasn't aware of the physical challenges. So this was a, quite a remarkable result for, for several reasons. Uh, most importantly, it's, it, it countered the dogma in the field, which was that wild type roots can't penetrate soils because they're too hard. They're physically too hard. And therefore the roots are not able to um, continue to grow. But as this result clearly demonstrates, the ethylene mutants are clearly able to grow. So it, it's, it was evident that uh, the roots were uh, was deciding to stop before they really had to. And so an ethylene appeared to play a critical role in this decision making. Now, we were obviously interested uh, whether this was also the case in other um, uh, plant species. And so uh, we uh, took advantage of the genetic resources available in the eudicot model, Arabidopsis. And we were very excited to see uh, that when we looked at the behavior of Arabidopsis roots in soil, we again, we could see this radial cortical expansion. This was lovely work that Bippin did to develop a miniaturized micro uh, um, um, uh, soil columns, which he could then uh, analyze them uh, subsequently. And when we took advantage of an ethylene receptor mutant in the ETR, this is again another ethylene is insensitive mutant, we observed that in this case, the ethylene sensitive Arabidopsis mutant continued to grow. So this tells us that the ethylene signal appears to be a conserved signal in other plant species, both in monocots and new dicots uh, in terms of soil compaction. So um, the next step was uh, to ask the question, does exposure to soil compaction actually trigger an ethylene response in root tissues? And so we took advantage of the IN3 uh, report that was developed many years ago. Uh, this is this transcription factor below IN2, which is stabilized uh, in response to uh, an ethylene when it senses an ethylene presence. And this is illustrated here in these controls in roots which have been treated with ethylene. And you can see, we see a massive uh, change. You get stabilization of this report in the nucleus nuclei of, set of root cells. So we took this report line, we grew them in compacted soil, and we observed in non-compacted soil, a very low, uh, no, uh, effectively no nuclear signal. But when we grew them in a compacted soil, we saw a, a dramatic change. And interest, intriguingly, we saw that the, the signal that was stabilized in the elongation zone rather than the meristem of the root. And this, remember, this is exactly where we see changes in cell expansion uh, and radial uh, cell expansion. So we found this a really exciting result. Um, we also uh, developed resources, similar resources using the orthologous uh, gene in rice called IL-1. So uh, Guchan Hang, uh, a, a, a superb scientist in uh, Shanghai, uh, in Darbing Zhang's team, uh, developed a transgenic uh, rice lines and we were able to show that this was also the case in rice. We saw under compacted conditions, we saw a, a very stabilization of the IL-1 uh, uh, reporter. So this begs the question, how does ethylene signaling increase uh, during a root compaction response? For example, are we seeing some form of mechano signaling? Could there be a mechano receptor which is controlling, uh, say, the ethylene production? Uh, under these conditions, that would be uh, what you would, how you you would uh, uh, imagine such a situation. So we set about to test this. We set about measuring hormone levels. Um, now, ethylene, the immediate precursion to ethylene is ACC, and so we micro dissected root tips grown in compacted and non-compacted soil. We measured the levels of ACC, and to our surprise, we saw that there was um, no statistical significant differences between um, roots either in compacted or non-compacted conditions. So this really um, uh, left us guessing, well, how does such a, uh, the, the, the dramatic change in ethylene response come about? And this, this really, uh, this is where our um, interdisciplinary approach, I think, really helped uh, because uh, 
uh, we asked the question, could the enhanced ethylene response, the basis of this, lie outside the root itself? Rather than be down to some mechano-signaling mechanism within the root, could it actually reflect the impact of the surrounding soil? So we uh, speculated that we know that ethylene is produced by roots. It's a volatile signal, uh, which is released by root tips. And we speculated uh, when we look at the structure of uh, non-compacted soil, the, this ethylene could uh, easily diffuse away and, and it's uh, away from the root tip and not interfere with root growth. In contrast, in the compacted soil, because of its, uh, high, its uh, highly compacted structure, maybe the ethylene uh, struggled to uh, um, be move away from this, the root tip. And this is actually what caused the triggering of the ethylene response. So to test this idea, um, Craig Storrock, who's a soil physicist, he's the manager of the Hounsfield facility, uh, analyzed the structure of uh, the soil using CT imaging. And he was able to uh, he dramatically see these are uh, data generated for three different um, um, samples of non-compacted and compacted soil. And he was able to see by through 3D visualization, the dramatic differences in soil pore space. So in non-compacted soil, we have far larger pores um, and these are highly interconnected. In contrast, in the compacted soil, uh, the, the actual air spaces are much smaller and they're also uh, less interconnected. And therefore you'd anticipate they'd uh, disrupt ethylene diffusion. Indeed, using this information, um, Olivier Martin uh, from Paris, who was doing a uh, sabbatical in our lab, uh, developed a soil model um, and he simulated ethylene movement through a soil lattice. And he uh, very elegantly demonst uh, demonstrated through his uh, simulations that uh, non-compacted soil, uh, uh, such as bulk density 1.1, as, as uh, you're familiar with now, uh, was able to um, um, allow ethylene to diffuse. In contrast, when we have highly compacted soil beyond 1.6 bulk density, you can see there's a dramatic reduction in um, ethylene diffusion. Now, these are obviously simulations. Um, the, the, the best data, I guess, is to actually do it experimentally. And this is where these two very clever ecophysiologists came into the, in, into the uh, equation. So Sean and Renz from Utrecht uh, designed a very simple but elegant way to test ethylene diffusion uh, through soil. And they developed this two-chamber solution. And between these two chambers is a neck, and that contains um, soil samples at different bulk densities. And so using this uh, uh, system, uh, Sean injected the upper chamber with ethylene, and then he, he took samples from top and bottom to see uh, how uh, rapidly the ethylene diffused uh, through the intervening um, neck. And using, using this approach, he saw a very interesting result. So when we had no soil between the two, uh, the two chambers, we saw a very rapid equilibration uh, of the ethylene levels in top and bottom uh, within 100 minutes. But if we had um, um, soil at a low bulk density, we could see it took significantly longer. But really, really surprisingly, if you had highly compacted soil uh, between these two chambers, we did not see any change in ethylene entering the lower chamber. And this, this experiment continued for up to 20 days. So this was an absolutely dramatic result. We were very, very surprised. So effectively, ethylene diffusion is abolished uh, in highly compacted soils, as is elegantly demonstrated uh, by Renz and Sean here. So the model that we propose in which ethylene diffusion is restricted in compacted soil appears to be the case based on uh, the CT imaging, the uh, mathematical modeling, and ultimately the experimental validation. So we wanted to see if this was, if uh, diffusion of ethylene, if it's as simple as that, then surely just simply covering the tip of the root with a, a gas impermeable barrier would be enough to trigger an ethylene response. 
And that's exactly, we tested that idea and using the uh, uh, IN3 GFP report line, we were able to see within hours, within two hours, we saw a, a, a large increase in the stabilization of this report in the elongation zone tissues. And so we were very excited by this result. It suggested that uh, this wasn't, uh, this ethylene response was nothing to do with mechano signaling. It appeared to be down to restricted diffusion. Um, many people ask the question, well, surely if you cover with a gas permeable barrier, could you be creating a uh, hypoxia response? And we used a number of different hypoxia markers. I'll show one here. Um, so we use, for example, PCO1. And this is a marker which, if you submerge the plant to expose it to hypoxia conditions, you can induce it very nicely. But if you cover it with a gas barrier, you do not induce it. And we've done this experiment on agar, and we've also repeated this in soil. And under neither compacted or non-compacted conditions can we induce it. However, we can induce it in soil if we submerge the roots. So the ethylene response we're seeing uh, here is not is completely different uh, from uh, um, the um, hypoxia response. Just to uh, all the work I've described so far has been done on sandy loam soils. Um, and uh, the benefit of working with soil scientists is that they really bring their expertise to bear. So Sasha, uh, uh, who was a co-lead on this project, uh, also uh, recommended that we check out uh, clay soils, which uh, in a very kind of general and crude way, you can divide soils into uh, two very general categories, clay soils, sandy loam soils. Uh, apologies, there are many thousands of soil types, but for the sake of this study, we checked out uh, clay soils and we saw the, exactly the same ethylene uh, induction uh, under compacted conditions. And so uh, this gave us confidence that this response appeared to be uh, um, uh, dis uh, uh, not dependent on soil type, but appeared to be through, uh, related to uh, ethylene diffusion. So just to summarize, um, it appears that plant roots sense soil compaction through restricted ethylene diffusion, and in non compacted conditions, roots are very happily, will grow uh, through the soil um, uh, as the ethylene is able to diffuse away. But in highly compacted soils, uh, roots, wild type roots struggle to grow because of the accumulation of ethylene at their root tips. And obviously uh, ethylene sensitive plants uh, have an advantage because they're not uh, uh, obviously slowed down uh, through this, the accumulation of this stop signal. So just to summarize uh, and maybe reflect on, on some of the things that we've, we've covered. So as I've highlighted, soil compaction is an increasing problem in agriculture, which really negatively impacts root growth and crop yields. Um, our results, I think one of the most surprising results uh, today uh, is that root growth arrest is, appears to be an adaptive response. And it's rather than just being caused by physical limitation. So plant roots appear to choose to stop before they really have to. Uh, and this appears to be an ethylene responsive process. And ethylene is employed um, in a indirect manner uh, to sense soil compaction um, because it's using the external structure uh, of the soil to regulate its diffusion. We've shown that disrupting ethylene sensitivity enables mutant roots to penetrate highly compacted soil. And that obviously has uh, opens up new avenues to breed crops having reduced sensitivity to compaction. So we're really excited by this uh, and we're starting to look at uh, uh, diversity panels of crops uh, using these, uh, these uh, various screening approaches to uh, maybe fast track the isolation of compaction resistant um, varieties. And uh, one really important point I'd like to emphasize at the end is this work was only possible by working with other disciplines. Uh, I've highlighted the importance of the soil science. If we hadn't looked outside the route, we wouldn't have solved this problem. Uh, we, this was underpinned by employing advanced imaging uh, to allow us to non-invasively monitor how roots are growing in soil. And also the mathematical modeling really helped us um, optimize and understand uh, 
the parameters involved in this particular process. And of course, uh, the, the molecular cell biology and, and crop physiology has been essential too. So I'd like to uh, really uh, say a big thank you to our sponsors uh, and also to uh, uh, Da Bing Zhang's team, who we've worked very closely with. This work was done in Arabidopsis and rice, and we couldn't have done the rice work without Da Bing's input. And uh, Go Chan uh, uh, Huang, uh, who's a fantastic postdoc in Da Bing's team. Bipin and Huang, uh, Go Chan have really uh, worked very closely together uh, to, uh, on the manuscript. Craig provided the soil physics. Well, who uh, was instrumental in the initial uh, observations that really catalyzed this, this study. Uh, Lottie was a master student who worked closely with Bipin to look at the cortical cell expansion work. I've described how Sean and, and Renz were critical in the ethylene diffusion, Olivier's modeling. Michael and Karen were critical uh, for uh, their HOMA measurements. Richard and Sasha uh, were both soil scientists who really helped us understand, as were Jonathan Lynch and Kathy. I would big thank you to Kathy, who is really the card carrying ethylene expert in the whole of this group. And her knowledge and wisdom and advice was, was really instrumental. Um, so I'd just like to thank uh, all my coworkers. And if I may, I'd just like to mention at the very end, I have this opportunity given the audience to highlight uh, a very important meeting that's coming up at the end of May. And this is a uh, in, this is a collaboration between uh, root, the Routing Twenty One uh, International Symposium on Root Development in Nottingham and the uh, International uh, Society of Root Research, the eleventh meeting, which is being held in Missouri. This, because of COVID, this meeting is now online, and we've worked closely. The two organising panels have worked amazingly closely together, and we've put together a schedule. Uh, I, I, um, we've created almost like a live aid uh, scenario where uh, we, by involving the US and the UK and through using the different time zones, we can, we've now got sessions which are occurring 24 hours a day for an entire week. And this is where we've come up with the name Root Research Never Sleeps. And we would really welcome participation from around the world. By doing this, hopefully we're gonna encourage lots of people to participate who would normally not have that opportunity. Um, together with these meetings, we've got, we've organized special themed issues in, in journals like Frontiers in Plant Science, Physiology of Plantarum and Plant Cell Environment um, uh, for various different themes. Registration is about to open. Uh, and uh, I should say that the costs are very uh, uh, competitive. And for all developing countries, um, the uh, registration fee is free. Uh, and we're very keen to encourage as much participation as possible. Uh, all talks uh, and posters will be online. And so we're very excited uh, to encourage uh, the attendees today uh, in participating, we hope you do, uh, in making this meeting a great success. So thank you so much for your time and uh, interest. And I'm gonna stop sharing now. Thank you, Malcolm. This is a fantastic story, amazing tools you have, and a great example of interdisciplinary science. We have several questions um, in our chat. Several of them um, relate the role of the microbiome in the mechanism that you show. So is there any evidence that the microbes in the rhizosphere differ between soils of different densities? What do you think about the possibility of microbially produced ethylene rather than plant source ethylene contributed to the differential root phenotypic responses in soil of different compactness? That's a really cool question and um, a really interesting in it one. Uh, in terms of the evidence, it would be a great way. Uh, um, well, I think plants would, uh, microbes would probably prefer if plants carry on growing. And so the trouble, if they produce ethylene, uh, they're going to disincentivize a plant depositing carbon into the soil. So I would imagine most microbes would want to encourage a plant to grow in soil. And in fact, many plants contain, um, they produce enzymes which degrade the precursor of ethylene called ACCD aminins. And it's still not known how by bacteria producing this, they actually are able to influence the plant, um, the plant um, 
um, ethylene levels. But um, this, I think, is, is a more likely scenario. So um, I, uh, this is a very broad, you, if you actually look at many different um, uh, micro, um, microbes, they contain these genes. So this is a very common trait. Um, and I suspect it's down to the fact that if they're able to do, remove ethylene from the system, they'll encourage the roots to grow in, and therefore the plant will deposit more carbon into the rhizosphere and that will help the microbes. Uh, but it's entirely possible that the reverse is also true. Um, and it would be very interesting to look for, for uh, microbes that are able to degrade uh, uh, ethylene or, or, or produce it itself. Um, so yeah, this is a really exciting question and one which I think deserves a lot more research. So to follow up on that, do the soil compactness affect the, can affect the mobility of non-volatile compounds? Like for example, do you know if the, um, for the, 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 the compactness of the soil um, influence the diffusion of the root exudates in the soil? That's another really great question. And I, I wondered whether I, I should start the talk by showing you a CT image of soil. And we always focus on the water and the soluble signals. And we think of the airspace as kind of a void, which doesn't contain information. But as my talk has shown, you know, this, this airspace actually is packed full of information. And it's likely that many additional volatile signals are present. Um, and in fact, we're, produce, we're putting together a, an idea for a grant application, one we call filling the void. And we'd love to explore other volatile signals such as methyl jasminates, terpenoids, and other such signals, which, you know, at the moment, uh, we're not sure uh, their roles, but uh, it would be fascinating to explore. It's possible that, you know, these volatile signals could play critical roles. And at the moment, we've been treating them as if they're soluble signals and not considering them in this, in this way. Thank you. We have also very uh, we have also plenty of question about the trade offs between the ethylene mediated reduction in root growth versus continued growth through the compacted soil. So why would the root want to stop growing? And also um, in A2 mutant roots uh, that grow just fine through the compacted soil. Do you see a trade off in growth anywhere else in the plant? So, for example, um, what is the phenotype of the of the shoot biomass? That's a great, that is a great question. And I, I, the way I answer it is, um, if you imagine a, a plant growing in, in a natural soil, um, it's likely um, that the part of the soil profile they're growing in is compacted. And so employing a, a signal like ethylene is really helpful um, because it, it stops them wasting resources in an area of the soil which may be too hard and allows them to reallocate the resources somewhere that's better placed. Uh, or, or they can they, they can penetrate deeper and and forage wider um, so in a kind of in a natural soil heterogeneous soil environment it makes a lot of sense employing the strategy in an agricultural soil it's it's really useless because every crop plant has to get through that plow pan and and that's a really strong barrier and you so you really want uh, a stop signal is not ideal for this you know, so you can imagine the plant pan is a major challenge for most crops to get through. And they end up trying to find uh, biopores to go down, uh, to enter the deeper soils. And so if, we, if the roots had the ability to overcome the plant bar pan and punch through, I think this would, this would unlock potentially a huge opportunity. In terms of the impact that it has on the rest of the plant, well, we've shown in the paper that plants which are ethylene, uh, roots which are ethylene resistant, uh, also, one of the downsides of compaction is the with reduction in root growth results in a, uh, also a reduction in shoot growth. And the ethylene mutants we, we, we observed, uh, as well as having increased root growth, the biomass in the shoot was also able to uh, be far less affected by compaction. I'm not suggesting we make plants entirely ethylene insensitive. I think that would be really naive because ethylene plays many other roles uh, during plant development, particularly in plant defense. But one approach that could be adopted is to somehow, because now we know where the ethylene response is occurring during compaction in the behind, just behind the root tips, if we develop tissue specific ethylene sensitivity mechanisms just in that tissue and not perturb the rest of the plant, we would have the best of both worlds. We'd have compaction resistance, but we wouldn't perturb defense responses, for example. So I think that we need to think uh, 
there are opportunities for some clever kind of um, GM or gene editing approaches or even natural breeding approaches to develop such, uh, such varieties. And the, the response that you, the, 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 the inhibition of growth you, you show mainly for the, for the primary root, do you also see it in, in lateral roots or shoot-born roots? Oh, that, that, that's great. We, we, we have tested, so far we've tested uh, the laterals and we saw exactly the same behavior, which we were surprised because, you know, many of the, the growth responses, are, they contrast, but uh, we measured this very carefully and we saw uh, a very similar relationship. So the ethylene insensitive mutants were able to penetrate the soil. And this could be really important when you're thinking about going into the deeper soil profiles. Maybe this is really going to help us open up uh, these profiles, which we're really just we're failing to explore, uh, as I illustrated at the start, by simply currently we're just going down the biopause in the case of wheat. And this may also be the case for other plant varieties, uh, plant crops um, as too. So, uh, you know, I think that, that uh, the control of ethylene uh, um, sensitivity in many different root classes is probably something very important uh, for a, uh, a crop to adapt and penetrate compacted soil. Thank you for thank you for this discussion. Um, we have a lot of questions that uh, unfortunately will for now remain unanswered, and with that we'll need to wrap up and uh, move to our second speaker. Our Thanks. second speaker, our second speaker is Edith Pierre, Pierre Jerome, who is currently a postdoc at Duke University. Edith graduated from genetics and plant biology and art history at UC Berkeley. She completed her PhD at the University of Washington, where she introduced the auxin response pathway from Arabidopsis into a synthetic yeast system. Edith further used this tool to identify and characterize the simplest auxin response unit. She received a fellowship from the Life Sciences Research Foundation that supports her current research at Duke on synthetic gene circuits regulating cell divisions in plants. Edith is one of the leaders of the Plantaia Front and Center Initiative to increase the visibility of Black, Indigenous, and Latin plant scientists. This is a part of the Changing Culture and Climate online resource, which I highly encourage you to get familiar with on the Plantaia website. Edith, it is great to have you here today, and I invite you to take the stage. Thank you, and um, I am very grateful to, for the invitation to be here and speak, especially after such a wonderful talk um, from Malcolm Bennett. Um, so I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, and today I'm, I'm gonna tell you a bit about the work I've been doing, um, trying to use synthetic biology to understand um, gene regulatory logic in plant development. And so I think this is a really, um, uh, exciting and complementary approach to, to systems and network biology. Um, because as you can see here, I'm, I'm showing you a typical example of a gene regulatory network. And this is uh, the embryonic stem cell network from mice. And as you can see, there's a lot of connections happening here, um, mostly between transcription factors. Um, and so we, we know that a lot of um, our core uh, cell processes um, and developmental processes are regulated by complex networks of, of molecules. Um, but with this amount of density and connection, it can be really hard to determine where to kind of start and at which point we can um, try to pull this network apart to really understand um, the logic that goes through in terms of um, regulating uh, these processes. And even when we zoom in here um, is the same network, but just the most interconnected uh, transcription factors. You can see that just within these transcription factors, there's still a lot of connections. Um, and what most of these, uh, and what's really hard to capture in these is, is what are, how or if these transcription factors are interacting with each other, um, whether uh, these multiple inputs are working together or at the same time. Um, and so uh, my, my approach to try, to try to tackle these questions and understand how transcription factors work together to regulate these key processes is to uh, build from the bottom up and try to uh, start from, uh, start from uh, some known interactions and then try to build up the level of complexity. Uh, and the system that I use in the Benfi lab is uh, looking at the Arabidopsis route 
for understanding the trajectory from stem cell to differentiated cell. And this is a, a great model uh, because in Arabidopsis, the, the root architecture is, is quite simple. Um, and because uh, root cells do not move in relation to one another, we can easily uh, identify the stem cell niche here in the root uh, apical meristem um, and then follow uh, the trajectory of of uh, cells that have taken up different uh, cell fates all the way for all the way up into the their differentiated fate. Um, and so one of the key uh, steps um, and features of a stem cell is that they undergo what are called asymmetric cell divisions. And so asymmetric cell divisions, uh, what they do is they produce daughter cells that go on to have distinct fate. And in this case, um, we uh, we have a really strong understanding of the network underlying um, one particular division in the in the root marrow stem, uh, where the stem cell divides and the those two daughter cells go on to take up the two distinct fates, one of the endodermis and the cortex. And uh, we know that there are two key transcription factors called short root and scarecrow that are critical for the stasymmetric cell division, because without um, when either of them are missing, we do not get this division, and instead we get a single mutant layer. And that's what I'm showing here to the right, where uh, previously you saw two layers, now we have one layer. And in short root in particular, uh, we end up also losing endodermal identity. So we know that these two key factors are critical for this division, and they actually work together. So short root activates the scarecrow, and then together uh, the uh, previous members of the Benfield lab have identified it that together they directly activated a, a D-type cyclin, in this case cyclin D6. And so this was uh, particularly exciting uh, because we, we saw this very direct pathway from these transcriptional regulators to uh, uh, a cell, cell cycle regulator and, and tying this um, cell division response. And here I'm showing you the expression pattern of uh, cyclin D6 in the root. And what was quite striking was the fact that it's very specific um, to these uh, stem cell um, daughter cells right before the division into our two, um, in, uh, two distinct cell layers of the endodermis and the cortex. Uh, so this told us that, uh, it, it, that uh, this activation of cyclin D6 by short root and scarecrow is, 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 is key to asymmetric cell division. And we understand that um, the D-type cyclins in particular are critical for initiating um, the uh, transition from the G1 to S stage in the cell cycle. Uh, but we know that this particular circuit is embedded in this much more kind of complicated network. Uh, and because we understood that these were direct connections, uh, we, uh, I, I chose the approach of trying to think about what, what, what would happen if we instead substituted a synthetic circuit for this endogenous one. In other words, can I, um, uh, how, how can we, uh, how can we better understand this regulation by constructing it from the bottom up once again? Um, and so essentially what I've, uh, what I've done is I've generated uh, synthetic feed forward loop. And so that's the, that's the name for this architecture that's very common across um, all regulatory networks, where we have uh, one transcription factor activating the next one, and both of them will then activate their target gene, in this case, cyclin D6. And I'm using synthetic transcription factors with orthogonal and modular parts. So these are well-defined parts that have been used um, quite extensively. So for the DNA binding, I'm using an engineered tau DNA binding domain where the specific sequence, DNA sequence that they bind can be uh, specified. Um, and then uh, the very commonly used VP64 activation domain. Well, I'm really interested in what happens in terms of cell division in the plants, uh, because there are multiple um, moving parts in, in trying to engineer this logic, uh, I started testing the functionality of the circuit itself by uh, introducing them in yeast and uh, es essentially using yeast for rapid prototyping of these parts and how they function together. So. Uh, in trying to break down the circuit, um, I thought of the feed forward loop as, as two specific steps. So we have one where X activates Y, and I've drawn a, a simple cartoon of what that, uh, that would look like in terms of the promoter and the activation. Um, and then the second part where X and Y activate their, darn, their uh, downstream target Z. And so this was a, a, a really um, 
interesting exercise in trying to think about how to design regulatory logic in terms of the arrangement and the type of binding sites that are put upstream of a promoter. So this first step was fairly straightforward where I could introduce the binding sites for X upstream of, of Y. And the way I characterized um, the range of activity that I was able to get with this system was by designing a series of um, promoters where I had a three, two, or one binding sites for each transcription factor upstream of a GFP reporter. And then I could use flow cytometry to, to uh, to directly measure um, the how much GFP fluorescence I got when the respective transcription factors were co-expressed in the yeast. And as, as we predicted, um, with the more binding sites, we got higher activity. So with the three, three binding sites for X, we have very strong activation. And this uh, closely mirrored the constitutive activation of my um, control promoter. And we saw a decrease uh, as the binding sites reduced. And interestingly, for the second transcription factor, while the, the overall design was, was identical, the only difference really was the DNA binding uh, sequence that it should bind, I got a quite different um, uh, activity in that I only got about, uh, it was about uh, a, a markedly decreased activity compared to transcription factor X. So I could see that I had a wide range of activity with one transcription factor and a more narrow range of activity, um, and that I could, you know, vary this amount of, of the amount of activity just by manipulating the transcription factor binding sites. So with that first step, um, um, and understanding the range of behavior, I focused on the second step, which was uh, quite a bit trickier and trying to understand how I could get both X and Y to activate Z. So I wanted them both to work together to activate their target gene and not get too much activation from um, the X alone uh, before it in initiated the expression of Y. And so I, of course, went back and thought about how what we understand about natural transcription factors and how they can work together. And of course, cooperativity came to mind. And looking back through the literature, um, historically, um, we understand that we can get cooperativity through physical interaction between two regulators. So if two transcription factors with neighboring binding sites have the capability to physically interact, we can get cooperativity. And this has been shown more recently to be done in a synthetic system using a PDZ domain and its cognate ligand. Uh, so I, I added a PDZ domain and a ligand to these transcription factors and then asked, do I see cooperativity when I have promoters that have a binding site for each factor? So similarly, um, I designed promoters where I have one transcription, one binding site for each transcription factor. And here you can see that on this particular promoter, each transcription factor activates at about the same amount. Um, and then I, and then what I did was I co-expressed the two transcription factors without the ability to interact, what I call X plus Y. So this would be the additive response that I would expect to see. And then with interaction, so with both of them having the, the, the ability to interact. And so what I call X and Y, the cooperative response that I was looking for. And I was pleasantly surprised that the that this the proximal binding sites and this interaction were sufficient to get me this cooperative response. So I do see an increase uh, just by co-expressing the two without the ability to interact. And I see a, a further increase now when I've added the, this capacity to interact. And when I swapped to the positions of the binding sites of the two transcription factors, what I saw was um, some quantitative changes in terms of the amount of, of activation and, and the basal activation of each uh, transcription factor. So there's definitely a lot of room to play with in terms of the, the architecture of the promoter and the level of cooperativity that I could achieve. Uh, but having um, established that I could in fact get cooperativity, um, I, I wanted to, to move into the plant system and then see how this function, how this circuit would come together in the plant itself. And so I worked to uh, generate single gene, uh, uh, single constructs where um, each of the genes were stacked into a single construct and integrating them into the into the root. So I could get um, stable integrated circuits um, and introduce them into a short root mutant background where again, this asymmetric division that I discussed does not occur and ask when I introduce this circuit or simpler circuit variants, such as this one where we, I have just direct activation of cyclin D6, can I get a rescue of cell division? And so um, while, and 
of course, uh, once we got into the plants and started looking at, at the constructs, um, the outcome was, of course, uh, more complicated than we went than uh, we had initially expected because while uh, we have we have really well characterized the division patterns of a wild type root which here I'm showing you the number of uh, essentially paraclinal divisions, so asymmetric cell divisions that happen in the cell file that happen in wild type, uh, it's average around one. And so that will give us one, you know, one division and two layers. Whereas in short root, we never get really a division. And so we always have the single mutant layer. What I've discovered is that the short root heterozygotes actually show a wide range of division phenotypes. And so you can see that quantified here. And then an example of what this looks like um, in the root itself, where I'll get these single, la la single layers and then these occasional divisions that kind of pop up. And I have um, quite a range here where I get no divisions, the single division, and then very often um, what we've known to be a response is some ad additional divisions that were happening. Um, and so this um, uh, uh, changed the way a bit for how we're looking at trying to understand this response. But now that I've characterized um, uh, these division phenotypes uh, much more fully, uh, I'm able to get a better understanding of what's happening in my actual circuits. So here I'm showing you the, the circuit that I've introduced into the short root mutant background, where I have a tissue specific promoter driving my first transcription factor activates the next transcription factor, and then both should activate our cyclone D6. And surprisingly, I found that the circuits with this um, feed forward loop circuit actually show us less asymmetric cell divisions, which is the exact opposite of what we expected to see, of course. And, and I'm showing, that, showing you that here um, in, in this particular example, where we see a lot more of the um, individuals where I've counted the divisions are kind of are between zero and one, um, whereas um, often in wild type and what I've shown here, they're at one. And then in the short root uh, heterozygote back background, we see kind of this range of division. Um, and so kind of going back and, and revisiting our model of, of, of short root and scarecrow regulating this, this cell cycle division, um, it does seem that, that um, we are getting, uh, I am getting a regulation of the, of the cell cycle by activating cycling D6, but not necessarily asymmetric cell division. I think what we're happening, what's happening here is uh, cycling D6 might be activating um, is in fact activating cell division. And the phenotypes that I'm seeing do see um, longer root lengths than I would normally expect, um, but not necessarily asymmetric cell division. So I've um, so with our model, it seems that there might there is very likely another factor that is responsible for this asymmetric cell division. And I'm currently looking into whether um, in fact this, this um, regular division or symmetric division that cycling D6 induces is um, a preliminary step for this asymmetric cell division, and also what might be happening in this network, because I'm seeing a lot of this response in the in the short root heterozygotes. So the dosage of short root is clearly playing a role in terms of the um, the response and potentially the feedback on the rest of this network. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention um, and the uh, members of the Benfield Lab, in particular, um, Jay Zhang, who's our fabulous technician and has been a tremendous help with this work, um, and um, the flow cytometry shared resource where I've done all the, the flow cytometry, cytometry and um, my funding sources from HHMI and LSRF. And before I stop for questions, I also wanted to do another quick plug for this changing and culture, changing cultures and climates initiative. That's been that's been a joint initiative uh, from ASPB and NASC. Um, and in particular, um, the initiative that I've been leading is is what I've called uh, front and center. So trying to bring increase the visibility and build community for the plant scientists um, that identifies Black, Indigenous, and Latin. And so here I'm just showing you um, what our Instagram page is looking like. So every week I post a profile um, of a plant scientist and a little bit of their work. And Imani Madison, who's also been on this initiative, has also uh, built a safe space on a, a private Discord server uh, for um, Black, Indigenous, and Latin plant scientists to come together um, and have a, uh, have a place to discuss, vent, uh, share experiences, et cetera. Um, so I, uh, so 
So if you haven't had the chance to check it out, um, the website is right here. If you're on Instagram, please follow us. And of course, if you know anyone um, or if you yourself identify um, as Black, Indigenous, or Latin, uh, you can uh, go to our the website on the Changing Culture and Climate page. And Katie Rogers has been wonderful so that she's made it quite easy for you uh, to sign up for either um, a front and center feature or for the safe space. Um, and, and Mary Williams and both Katie Rogers have been wonderful in terms of uh, helping us host um, all these resources on Plante. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Edith. This is a beautiful research and a very powerful system you are using. Uh, we have several questions in our um, in our uh, Q and I box. The first one is: What trait of fit forward loops? make it advantageous to occur so often in gene regulatory networks? Yeah, so I think that's that's actually the, the key question. And so this has been mostly explored mathematically. Uh, and mathematically speaking, uh, feed forward loop is uh, by having that second uh, uh, activator be required for that downstream response. It's meant to, it's thought to work as a, um, as a signal decoder. So it'll only respond to a, a longer signal and not to spurious signals. So in things like developments, the idea is that you don't wanna have an irreversible response activated by a false signal. And so you only make that transition when that's critical. Um, and so the, the goal with this system was to uh, really test that, that idea experimentally. And that is, um, and that is something that I'm, I'm still working towards is to test that idea or whether this, you know, these, um, additional connections may be due to passive evolution, for example, because the addition and removal of binding sites, you can do that with the mutation of, of one or two uh, base pairs in the DNA sequence. So that's that's definitely still a question that's um, that we're trying to answer. And are these feed forward loops, um, are they um, occur so often in, in, in across uh, uh, kingdoms? Like are there also, or is it a plant specific um, thing? Regulation. Oh yes, yeah. It's 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 essentially across all networks, and so the the earliest ones were bacteria and yeast, and as and as um, the ability to generate these networks in higher systems um, has has come into being, we it, it's seen that it it is just in it, just in about every system across kingdoms. Mm. Okay, we have another question. Did you check the mRNA levels of the cycling D six in feed forward synthetic circuit containing plant? Yeah, so that's that's our next steps is to confirm and see how much the levels of the cycling D6 are impacting the the um, the ability to divide as well as um, if there's any short root levels in some of these heterozygous backgrounds. Okay, the next question is: um, It looks like your synthetic circuit carrying plants have extra cell divisions also in the epidermis. What is your approach to delim delimiting cycling D6 expression just to the cortex and endodermis? Yeah, so that's, um, it's actually quite tricky. And actually, because I've been looking at these, the, um, just our short root heterozygous heterozygote plants much more closely. That's actually something that's not necessarily due to my circuit, but is, is something that I see quite often in the short root heterozygotes. So it does seem like short root is actually doing much more in terms of divisions and different tissue types than we had, than we had anticipated. And because I was um, really trying to get at this question of specific divisions, I was really forced to look at this closely. And, and, and yes, I'm observing this um, being quite common. And then in terms of trying to focus it in on the um, just the cortex or the that mutant ground layer, um, I used uh, 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 an endodermis specific promoter that's still active in short root. But as we're learning, especially now with um, all the the RNA seq that we've been doing, the single cell seq, it's not so much a tissue specific as is tissue enrichment. And we see a little bit of that loss when short root is gone. So I think um, continuing to, to test these, these, you know, um, these markers of, of cell identity in different mutant backgrounds to really try to understand why do we get expression in those particular layers and how um, these things might change. So for those divisions in the epidermis, um, I think is gonna be quite critical to, to really get into uh, designing promoters that will be you know, much more specific and much less uh, variable in different backgrounds. We have one more question. 
are X and Y continuously active in the artificial system or do you induce this at some T0? And how does this reflect the situation with Scarecrow and short root? So at the, um, the, the work that I've shown you today are all from our constitutively, constitutively active so that I can see any, any types of response um, in either of the background. Um, and in terms of short root and Scarecrow, um, we know that uh, short root actually is activated in the vasculature and moves into the endodermis and the stem cells in order to activate this division. So they do tend to be on together. They do bind and interact with each other. So in that case, I am mimicking that interaction to regulate their targets. Um, but I am working on an inducible system um, in order to uh, be able to manipulate and, and, and look at what happens in response to the circuit over time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Edith, for this uh, discussion. So with this, I would like to thank you again for your talk. Uh, thank you, Malcolm, Malcolm for your talk. Um, thank you, for Katie, um, for an organizer. And um, thank you, everyone, for, for attending. Yes, thank and you very thank much. You, thank you, Dorota, for the excellent moderation. Um, we'll see you at our next Plante Presents event. Thank you all for joining. <laughs>